And let me once again welcome everybody officially to today's online event, Emergency Evacuation from Major Cities. Today's event is sponsored by the Program on Emergency Preparedness and Crisis Management and the Government Innovators Network at the Harvard Kennedy School. And I'd like to turn things over to today's moderator, Arne Howitt, the Executive Director of the Taubman Center for State and Local Government and the Co-Director of the Program on Emergency Preparedness and Crisis Management. Dr. Howitt. Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you this afternoon and uh, also to uh, be able to introduce to you a very distinguished uh, panel of experts uh, and very experienced practitioners on emergency management. Um, in Los Angeles, uh, we have with us Ellis Stanley, who is now the Director of Western Emergency Management Services for the firm of Dewberry and Davis. Um, but for 30 years before this, uh, Ellis was a uh, uh, Director of Emergency Management in a number of, uh, of um, cities and communities, uh, most recently uh, serving as General Manager of the Emergency Preparedness Department of the City of Los Angeles. Uh, also with us today, uh, from uh, uh, Harris County, Texas, the home of the city of Houston and a much larger geographic area surrounding the city, is Mike Montgomery, who is the fire marshal of the county um, and also uh, the former emergency management coordinator of Harris County. And from Springfield, Illinois, uh, we have with us Andrew Velasquez, who is currently the uh, director of the Illinois uh, State Emergency Management Agency, um, and before that was the uh, uh, executive director of Chicago's uh, Office of Emergency Management and Communications. Um, welcome, gentlemen. We're very delighted to have you all here. Um, let me just uh, set the scene for um, uh, our discussion this afternoon, and then I'm going to turn to each of our panelists to make uh, a brief introductory discussion. Um, and then after that part of our, uh, of our um, uh, afternoon's activities, which will take a little bit more than a half hour probably, uh, we will then turn uh, to audience participation. And we certainly encourage you all uh, to submit uh, questions to us uh, for the chat. Uh, Emergency management uh, uh, has been with us at least as long as disasters have, which is the entire history of mankind. And certainly evacuation has been a big part of emergency management in many situations. Here in the United States, though, we've become particularly concerned about the issue of evacuation from catastrophic events, particularly in cities, uh, at least since the experiences of September uh, 11, uh, 2001, uh, in New York and uh, in Washington, D.C., um, and even more especially since Hurricanes Katrina and Rita hit the United States in the late summer and early fall of uh, 2005. There's been a tremendous concern about whether, given those experiences, about whether the preparedness for a catastrophic evacuation experience is adequate in American cities. Um, in June of 2006, the U.S. Department of Transportation and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security together uh, issued a report which examined the evacuation readiness of 75 major urban areas in the United States. Um, they looked at whether these areas were ready to deal with the problems that evacuation would produce uh, under conditions of a catastrophic event. And they had several major findings in this report. Um, first of all, uh, while they saw that most state and local plans uh, for emergency response had adequate decision-making and management structures uh, for evacuation under non-catastrophic conditions, it wasn't clear whether that was true for catastrophic disasters. There was concern that these management systems um, and decision-making systems might break down. Um, secondly, in looking closely at the plans that the cities had for uh, identifying hazards and laying out the response that they would have um, under disaster conditions, uh, there was a feeling that these were reasonably appropriate uh, for non-catastrophic disasters, um, but weren't going to be adequate if there were something the scale of Hurricane Katrina. And furthermore, um, in these plans, there typically was not sufficient um, sufficiently robust plans for coordinating the surrounding jurisdictions. 
uh, public communications plans they found uh, were adequate for before event communication, um, but were much less robust uh, for during event communication. There was concern uh, that communications would break down and be inadequate for letting people know where they should go, what was expected, etc. Um, perhaps the most glaring aspect of, um, of shortcoming that we found in this uh, investigation of the 75 major areas uh, were the plans for special needs evacuation, which were seen as being uh, particularly underdeveloped, um, but also underdeveloped were transportation plans, again, seen as adequate under um, ordinary circumstances, um, but probably not sufficient if there was a very large-scale evacuation that crossed jurisdictions and it required the coordination of not only um, cities and towns in a region, but also coordination with the uh, state government and the federal government. Um, and finally, the report found uh, that plans for exercising uh, so that emergency responders could get practice under a number of different uh, contingent scenarios um, while uh, uh, appropriate uh, for many conditions uh, were not often set up so that they would allow state-to-state -state relationships or involvement of federal officials. They were mainly oriented towards individual states or towards uh, individual communities. So in this context, we wanted to examine the question of whether uh, and what cities are doing now um, and what some of the major issues are in getting better prepared for evacuations from situations like Hurricane Katrina, um, in which uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people were successful in evacuating, self-evacuating primarily from the city of New Orleans, um, but where uh, about 100,000 other people were left stranded in the city, uh, people who did not have access to automobiles or were unable to use them, um, or in uh, Houston, which set only several weeks after Hurricane Katrina uh, in September of uh, 2005, uh, uh, had a warning of a very severe uh, hurricane approaching the, the uh, Galveston Houston coast um, and with that warning got uh, upwards of one and a half million people on the roads uh, for um, uh, evacuation but who wound up with many practical op operational problems in dealing with that. I'm sorry to interrupt Dr. Howitt. Um, panel, we're getting a little bit of feedback and I'm not sure what the source is, but I think one way we can eliminate it is if you all mute your phones um, until uh, Dr. Howitt calls on you to speak. All right, hopefully that'll uh, improve matters a little bit. Uh, thank you. Continue. Getting ready for evacuation is a very complex challenge, and certainly it's not a situation where one size fits all. Uh, different regions face different kinds of threats. Some of these threats, like hurricanes, uh, will, be, will give some advance notice, perhaps a week, perhaps a few days. Um, but other events, like earthquakes or terrorist attacks, may be no-notice events. They'll be well in progress, and danger will be there um, with no warning whatsoever. Uh, it is always a, a, a crucial question to decide whether people should shelter in place or evacuate. Evacuation has many difficulties, and frequently sheltering in place um, will be the most sensible policy, but there will certainly be situations where evacuation is called for. And under these circumstances, government's role is going to be both facilitating the self-evacuation of many citizens who have access to automobiles or some other form of transportation, um, but providing aid to people in a variety of circumstances that make them much less mobile than those who have auto access. Um, evacuation calls upon uh, a very rich mix of operational capabilities um, and the need for complex coordination, um, not only within a given jurisdiction between the agencies um, that might be involved, police, fire, medical, uh, transportation, public works, and others, but also between adjacent jurisdictions and jurisdictions that are further along the line along which uh, people are leaving. Um, and finally, intergovernmental relations from one level of government to the other, between local governments and the state, and between the state and uh, the, the state and the federal government. Um, so the question arises: 
how should we prepare for these kinds of situations? What do we need to do uh, to be able for both governments and individuals and their families to be ready uh, to handle these kinds of circumstances? And what obstacles are faced um, uh, as we make plans for it? Um, this is the view from the, from the uh, perspective of government practitioners, um, but there also is a view from the point of view of the public. How will they respond? And uh, here is a uh, diagram uh, that I won't uh, attempt to explain at this point from the work of uh, uh, Professor Ronald Perry uh, that illustrates the many factors that go into a decision by an individual to actually evacuate um, and that determines the type of behavior that that individual uh, will engage in while uh, uh, in an evacuation situation. So with that introduction, let me turn uh, to our panelists. And I'd like to call first on Ellis Stanley to talk to us a bit about um, the issues that Los Angeles has been thinking about and that uh, um, sh uh, shape the kinds of uh, emergencies that they are looking at and uh, uh, some of the issues that they've identified that are problematic. Ellis? Uh, thank you, Arne, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, enjoying the opportunity to be able to participate in this forum. As uh, Arne had indicated, there's, there's not a one-size-fit-all in this process. There's a great a bit of uncertainty, and you have to deal with it from the standpoint of uh, having some type of emergency evacuation decision system, because unlike uh, hurricanes that uh, typically are coming from one direction, you can do a lot of pre-planning, there are many catastrophic events that we don't have the luxury of, of doing that with. So we have to look at uh, creating a way to manage uh, no-notice evacuations to be able to take the real-time traffic conditions, the real-time demographics, the real-time weather situations, and, and incorporate it into uh, our processes. Uh, there could be free rate closures either by uh, calamities that may cause the need to relocate people or from uh, other things. There could be debris on those uh, uh, freeways or, or whatever. But it is a challenge for the emergency management system as we look at doing that because we have to make sure that we do the planning piece. There's a couple phases of this. There's the planning phase and then there's implementation phase. In the planning phase, we need to be able to identify the evacuation scenarios. We do a lot of that through uh, practicing and, and simulation. Again, partnering with our partners and preparedness, such as the universities, to look at their capability to bring good, strong simulation methodologies to the table. Traffic control points. Where are we going to put people? And we look at different shelters. There was a time when you looked at uh, hosting and um, relocating people, and then other jurisdictions would do that. In today's time, uh, and especially in, in mega uh, metropolitan areas where you have um, uh, four or five hundred square miles of, of jurisdiction, you may just be going to the other side of that jurisdiction, depending on what the hazard is. Uh, then support, where do, you, where do you stage people? If you got everybody going one direction, how do you get your uh, emergency support uh, vehicles and resources into place? Uh, in, incorporating it into the uh, command systems, et cetera. All of those are important. Uh, one of the things that we learn almost instantly, especially when you're looking at things like hurricanes, is that evacuations are a regional concept. You're not in this by yourself, and it's important that you approach it from a regional perspective, especially when you consider that many of the assets that you deal with are in nature regional, uh, railroads, uh, metropolitan transit authorities, uh, your rails and, uh, and bus systems, those are regional components in most instances uh, that's uh, incorporated with those local or private resources that you would have. Uh, special needs population planning is very important, not only those that will be relocating, but those that have to be in place. And when you're talking about sheltering in place, making sure that the population is aware and understanding of the language that we're talking about, that they, can, uh, that they are um, appreciate and, and know what uh, instructions are being given to them. And then there, there's that legislative piece. How do we make sure that the elected officials and the powers to be are part of that process so that we don't have conflicting um, uh, 
information coming out from uh, the elected officials, the mayor saying one thing, the governor saying something else, et cetera. So it's important that that's all coordinated. It's important as well that we take those tools that many cities have, or what I call smart cities, have those uh, integrated tools, those traffic management centers, making sure that they are in incorporated into the process, into the planning process, and making sure that we use these tools in an effective manner so that um, uh, we, we get the best out of it, we can benefit from the uh, things that we're putting forward. Making sure that we put training in place for not only our fire and law enforcement, et cetera, but those other partners in preparedness or first and secondary responders, whether it's DOT, public works, or et cetera. Uh, making sure that we understand the response levels, not only the response side, but the public that has to receive this. Uh, and keeping training and uh, good public information going. Those are the keys to making these things successful. And I'll be delighted to uh, answer questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. I'd like to turn now uh, uh, to Harris County, Houston, Texas, and Mike Montgomery. And uh, ask Mike to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what his locale has been doing to deal with uh, special needs individuals. Um, with the experience, watching the experience of Hurricane Katrina and being a reception center for refugees from Hurricane Katrina and then experiencing, and then experiencing um, the problems of, um, of Hurricane Rita, um, the Houston area has uh, uh, done a great deal to think very hard about the problem of dealing with uh, people who do not have access to uh, automobiles or who face disabilities in using them. Mike? Thanks, Arne. One, one, one of the first things that we learned right off the bat was evacuating any major metropolitan area presents tremendous challenges. Uh, one of the key things that we learned in our lessons learned was obviously is we had three times as many people on the road as we expected on the road, and that, that uh, did a lot for the congestion. But more importantly, we had over five times as many people evacuated as actually needed to evacuate. So as, as uh, Mr. Stanley was saying, getting the notification out and making sure that people clearly understand if there truly is a need to evacuate is, is, is uh, paramount to, to success. Uh, we also found out, uh, just real quickly, some of the lessons learned. Things like uh, additional lane openings uh, through contraflow or other means, having uh, uh, additional fuel stations on the, on the designated routes, comfort stations uh, uh, where people could relieve themselves. But key was this public notification. One of the things that we really have spent our time in Texas on is developing ways that we can feel confident that, that those of our citizens with special needs will be able to evacuate. And there are two key groups that we needed to focus on. And the first of these key groups were those that, that just needed transportation. They just need some assistance in getting out of the danger zone. And second are those with medical conditions that uh, would have an impact on, on their ability to evacuate. Um, and also, we don't all want to overlook those that have pets or companion animals. Uh, prior to, 19, or to 2005, with Hurricanes uh, Katrina and Rita, some of the sheltering operations were very reluctant or actually had policies where they could not accept pets uh, or companion animals. So what the state of Texas has done is we've uh, categorized and grouped our special needs residents into uh, six categories. The first of these, level zero, is, are those that just simply need uh, additional transportation assistance. And there's levels one through five are for those that have uh, varying degrees of medical uh, conditions that will require some, some special consideration. And where this really goes down to, and I won't spend a whole lot of time on each of these slides in detail, but we've identified three key areas. Uh, first is to identify your special needs populations and uh, how you want to categorize and group those into, uh, into some sensible groupings. Uh, second thing is decide what transportation modes are most, uh, most effective in, in transporting those, especially when you get into the medical needs. Uh, level four, level five, those with severe medical needs, either chronic or acute, uh, ground or air ambulance is probably the most appropriate way to get these folks around. Uh, some other alternates uh, may look good on, on paper, but these are fairly fragile folks that uh, we got to be very careful how we transport them. And then the third thing is uh, to make sure in our special needs sheltering 
that uh, once we get people out of the danger zone, that we're putting them in a in a shelter that is conducive to uh, to their needs, and that we match those shelter requirements with the uh, with the folks that are coming in. So, in summary, I guess what I'd like to say then, a special needs program. Uh, really, I'd recommend three things. Number one, that you uh, have a way that you can uh, notify folks that your program exists. Number two, that you've got a fairly robust way of, of registering these folks in, uh, simply because there are some, some HIPAA and some other uh, 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 identification challenges. And then third is to make sure you've got a, a very good way of identifying and notifying these folks when an emergency does occur so that you can notify them that they do need to consider evacuation. And once again, I'd appreciate the opportunity to participate. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I'd like to turn now to uh, Andrew Velasquez, uh, who, uh, from his position uh, first as the uh, uh, Executive Director of uh, Emergency Management of the City of Chicago, uh, was concerned not only with his own uh, emergency plans, but also with their relationships uh, with other communities in Cook County and the surrounding metropolitan area, and now operating from a different institutional perspective uh, as the emergency uh, managed as the director of the emergency management agency for the state of Illinois, uh, is now looking at problems of cooperation across the local governments of uh, Illinois and between those governments and the state. Uh, Andrew? Arne, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity uh, to serve on this uh, panel and to be a part of this very important discussion. Um, as you mentioned, you know, I have the experience coming from both city and state, and I think I, I bring a unique perspective on the issue of the evacuation. Uh, having these, you know, served in these two positions has allowed me to see the evacuation problem, as you mentioned, from the perspective of a large urban area. And that being, you know, from the from the perspective that, you know, the threat profile in a large urban area, you know, with that profile we would need to move large numbers of citizens out of harm's way. Um, as, as you may recall, um, when I served as executive director for the city of Chicago, I supervised the planning and execution of the nation's uh, first large-scale mass evacuation drill in the downtown area. And that experience taught us a great deal about the need for close community coordination and evacuation planning and the need to look out to other communities. Oftentimes we talk about the importance of having they have to evacuate large cities, but Oftentimes we don't think about, well, where are we going to place these people? Where are they going to go? Uh, as they're leaving the city, uh, from an egress perspective, are we going to have the appropriate plans in place to include sheltering locations to, or way stations to receive these individuals that may, have, may need some medical attention or may need to be reunited with family members? And so as Director of IEMA now, at the state level, you know, I realize that these are some areas of concern that we have to make sure that we address. And so um, in, in a minute I'll address you know, some of these issues that relate to the importance of multidimensional planning within the state and across the region to address you know, the issue of mass evacuation. Um, so uh, in addressing you know, evacuation, there are some things that we truly need to be mindful of. And the reality of it is, is that the problems of evacuation may not involve the entire population per se, but on the, the high end of the spectrum, there may be a need to service in some fashion hundreds of thousands of individuals. And so the problem may very well be massive. Uh, we are dealing with a range of individuals who will you know, all have a range of needs from the oldest among us to the youngest. And so we need to understand that range and factor that uh, issue into our plans. As uh, Mike Montgomery mentioned earlier, uh, I think the, it's important that we, we recognize the issue of pets. I mean, uh, we will have to deal with everything from people to pets. And so unless we accommodate you know, individual needs, uh, you know, we won't be successful you know, in this effort. There's also issues pertaining to the logistics of tracking and the reunification you know, of individuals, which will require massive cross-jurisdictional coordination. And so from the perspective of the state of Illinois, um, you know, we look at this from a, from a two-fold approach, if you will. And so given the stakes you know, at issue in managing large-scale evacuations, 
um, we are looking to enhance our you know inter community linkages within the state and at the same time expanding our base of regional cooperation. I mean the push to enhance <clears throat> our state capabilities in processing and sheltering evacuees is key to addressing disasters. We need to ensure that a system uh, is in place to link resources in communities to feed, to care for, and to shelter displaced individuals. Uh, the uh, development of linkages has to occur within communities among government, business, and non-governmental organizations and between communities. Uh, horizontal and vertical linkages to accommodate you know, the pressures of massive numbers of displaced persons is going to be critical and key. Um, the regional collaboration component is a recognition that while all disasters may start locally in our independent society, local disasters will soon be matters of regional concern requiring regional solutions. So to address our local problems, we are working with our partners at FEMA, at the FEMA regional office to address uh, some of those concerns. Um, we, we, we also look at this from a, a hub and spoke shelter philosophy or approach. Um, hub processing centers will be organized in the largest shelter possible for that city. Hub centers may include arenas, convention centers, stadiums, university buildings, and other large open space facilities. The main goal for a hub or processing center is to evaluate evacuees for any special needs or sheltering issues. When we talk about the importance of you know, ensuring that we, we can address special needs populations during evacuations, we often have to make sure that we have the appropriate measures in place, uh, the appropriate components in place to receive individuals who have special needs. Uh, once you know, adequately evaluated, evaluating the evacuee, uh, we may place you know, that evacuee in a nearby shelter um, you know, to ensure that he or she resolves any situational problems that occurred from you know, the disaster or you know, the evacuation. Um, these are you know, the key representatives of the regional planning group that we have established. It would be very important for these players to coordinate and address the many obstacles in planning for a mass evacuation. Each local, state, and federal representative will bring their areas of expertise and create a response, a realistic response, to an evacuation. And we've had a number of these regional collaboration uh, meetings, if you will, and it has worked exceptionally well because we brought partners together from, as you mentioned, Aaron, Cook County and a number of the other large counties within the state of Illinois. We have 102 counties bringing all the individuals together to talk about the importance of evacuating folks out of the city of Chicago and even beyond uh, areas within the state of Illinois. So these are the key, um, let me just go back here, these are the key representatives of the regional planning group and uh, as I said before it would be important for these players to coordinate and address you know, the many obstacles in planning for a mass evacuation. So in essence, developing you know, a collaborative atmosphere in areas of communication, um, evacuation, sheltering, and resource allocation will provide the most efficient way of addressing you know, the situational awareness problems, which then may be addressed by the responsible agency or government entity. Awareness of responsibilities and execution of those responsibilities will provide for a flexible response, ensuring mitigation measures at all levels. We will ultimately save lives and provide for the best coordinated response to a catastrophic disaster. And so this is just um, a slide here to show you know, how some of these um, areas of collaboration uh, should be executed. Uh, establish you know, an organizational structure for regional collaboration. Identify key stakeholders that should be a part of that you know, uh, organizational structure. Develop a governance structure. Set organizational goals and objectives. Develop uh, required agreements. And when we get to the area of uh, communications, establish a sound communications plan uh, to support regional collaboration and regional cooperation goals. Identify key personnel. Establish a call tree. Different things of that nature. And you can see here on all the different bullet points uh, the key elements that are important to this regional collaboration effort. So. Uh, thank you again very much for this opportunity and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that may arise. Thanks very much, Andrew.
Um, I wanted to uh, take that we've already gotten a number of questions uh, from our listeners, and I want to encourage anyone who has other questions to please submit them. Um, but let me start off with uh, one that we received. Um, in terms of the planning that each of you has described for your jurisdiction and the more general uh, um, ideas that you've given us about planning, um, could you identify where this might differ uh, for events for which there is some notice or advance warning as opposed to situations in which there's no notice and where events start very suddenly um, without the opportunity to get any uh, um, uh, pre-prepared plans operating. Ellis, would you like to tackle that question, the difference between notice and no-notice events? This is Ellis with um formerly from the city of Los Angeles. Um, with those notice events, you have an opportunity to bring uh, all the players around the table, not only the responders, but uh, uh, the people that will be implementing and, and potential victims and let them know that, especially for things like hurricanes or, or things like um, even a tsunami evacuation. These are your routes. These are the ways. These signs are posted. You follow the instructions and uh, in an orderly fashion, you can uh, get out. In no notice, not only do you not know it's going to happen, you don't know from whence it will come. So where you may be geared to go left, you may have to, to go right. So what you have to do is plan for that uncertainty. You have to let folks know that in ideal cases, if it's situation one, this is what you do. The, the trick in most of the situations are, and, and, uh, and, and uh, yes, is that you want to have a system in which the siren, if you will, will be to turn on your radio or TV to get the appropriate information. This is what's occurred. There may be a plane crashed into a chemical facility. The wind may be blowing in this direction. These are the instructions we want you to follow. Those instructions would be everything from stay where you are, turn off your ventilation system, to come out, go right, continue to go right, until you are instructed to stop. The no notice events, we look at uh, evaluating the um, potential of these things happening, sitting down with the community, sitting down with uh, uh, your first responders and say, if this is the case, this is what we will do. Uh, it would be easy if the disaster read the plan and we could just put the plan as, as we needed, but it's, it's not the case. In no notice events, you also don't know whether the infrastructure is in place to accommodate what you, what the plan says. If the no-notice event is an earthquake and your infrastructure is damaged, you've got to get that information before you start moving people. Uh, the, fortunately, in most situations with earthquakes, you are not relocating um, people. So that's one of the differences in no-notice events. Pardon this, Mike Montgomery. If I could also jump in there. Uh, I, I want to agree with everything that, that Ellis has said and add a couple. Uh, the, the, the concept sometimes of notice versus no notice of events, sometimes uh, practitioners try to divide those into proactive and, and reactive response. And one of the things, that, the lessons that we really learned strongly from the, uh, the uh, Operation Katrina Reliance City Mega Shelter operation were that it was the prior re relationships that had been established between the responders and uh, the command staff that allowed, even though there wasn't a written plan in place per se for that specific event, it allowed these people to come together and be very effective in a short period of time. Uh, and, and one of the other points that, that uh, Ellis made that I wanted to echo is if we can identify what the most potential, the most common risks and hazards are for our respective areas, develop plans to respond to those, then exercise and practice those plans, even in a no-notice event, it, it really increases the chance of success simply because now we are responding as we have been trained to respond and the citizens are reacting the way they have been instructed and trained to react. Arne? Yes. Andrew Velasquez. I'd just like to add to that, you know, Aaron, what's important here too, and I think Mike touched on it as well as Stanley, uh, Stanley covered it uh, very well comprehensively, but, you know, let's say, for instance, with a city like Chicago, uh, if, if you had to evacuate, you know, um, 
close to 600,000 people you know, out of the central business district on any given day. Uh, what's important there is having that strong collaboration among your, you know, public safety, your public works, but also your private sector, you know, partners that also, you know, have a big stake in, you know, the central business district or the financial sector. And that's having a partnership with your security directors uh, in those offices uh, that are responsible for providing security for many of those large skyscraper type buildings and making sure that they, too, are part of your planning efforts, part of your, your briefings that you provide, you know, on a monthly basis, making sure that they are all roped in and in the loop because when something like this occurs, and typically in a city like Chicago it would be a no-notice event, you want to make sure that you have all of those communication, uh, those communication modes in place so that way you can immediately send out information to ensure that people know exactly what they need to do and know exactly that you need to follow the instructions of the officials that will be, you know, both broadcasting as well as on the ground. And so early on establishing those partnerships, making sure that those individuals in the private sector understand your plans and are part of your plans to ensure that there is continuity when something like that may occur, you know, in, in relation to a no notice of that. Point, because one of our other uh, listeners asked the question of how you plan to integrate uh, contracted services and even internal within government uh, service support um, during an event that may disrupt all of the uh, routines that you're expecting to see in place. Uh, Andrew, would you like to address that? Sure. You know, we, we learned from the 9-11 Commission that 85% of the critical infrastructure is owned by the private sector. You know, that's important. I mean, you know, having the private sector, you know, as part of your, your homeland security strategy or your emergency preparedness strategy is key. Um, you're going to need to call upon the private sector for assistance, and, and, and they may need to call upon government for assistance during a catastrophic incident. And so, absolutely, uh, in, just to use in Illinois as an example, we have the Illinois Terrorism Task Force that's comprised of 15 committees. One of those committees is the private sector committee. We also have a, a committee that, that works directly with the unions. So that way we can assess and determine, you know, what resources are available from you know, the contractors, the electricians, those companies out there that have heavy equipment, making sure that we have partnerships with the private sector so that way we can bring all these resources to bear, you know, during a catastrophic event. And so partnering with the private sector is key. Ellis, what does that look like from Los Angeles? Well, um, as Director Velasquez said, uh, they are part of the team. Uh, what are you looking at? incorporating some 90,000 security, uh, private security uh, employees into the process, or whether you're looking at uh, a private transit system that carries uh, people to doctors on a day-to-day -day basis or senior citizens to uh, the Mills on Wheels program. Uh, they're part of the fabric of the community. Uh, one of the other private uh, partners that we haven't talked a lot about is uh, the universities, colleges and universities is within your jurisdiction. They have uh, transportation systems in place. They have um, accommodation systems in place. So it's a matter of bringing them to the table, understanding where you fit on the priority of things, and more impo as importantly, uh, are it's working them into the uh, planning process, working them into the exercises, making sure that when you have to give these instructions to do certain things, it's not new to them. They don't have to worry about who's going to pay them, how the process of being reimbursed is going to work, because they've worked all that stuff out. At the time that the balloon goes up, it's about implementation and feeling comfortable in the process of planning that you have worked all the, 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 the details that typically slow down things. You've worked all that out. So the private sector has a huge role. The non-governmental organizations, your volunteer agencies, again, working them in the process in making sure that they're part of the exercise that you do and uh, keeping them uh, in the loop. And, and our understanding, Alaska, is that just to add on to what Ellis said, because that's very key and important, you know, making sure that they have a seat in your emergency operations center, making sure that they, they know that they have a role or a stake in part of your planning efforts. And as Ellis mentioned, you know, making sure that they are part of your, your exercises uh, in your drills, that's going to be critical and key for you know uh, working toward addressing you know the mitigation of a circumstance 
you know, should we be faced with something like that catastrophically in, in Chicago or Illinois or any other jurisdiction for that matter? What I'm hearing is that uh, there are a great number of stakeholders involved in this and that uh, bringing them in to feel a sense of uh, partnership and collaboration with government is crucial. That really leads to another question that one of our listeners has asked, um, which is the uh, question of command and control systems. How, how well do the systems that we have in place work when they're not dealing with the hierarchical situation of a given um, unit of government, but instead are reaching across uh, a variety of non-governmental stakeholders and are engaging uh, jurisdictions and perhaps other levels of government uh, that aren't subject to the authority of the jurisdiction in which the disaster occurred. So the, the focus is on the command and control uh, systems that are in place and whether these are adequate to deal with uh, situations in which there's so many stakeholders whose work has to be coordinated. All right, this is uh, Ellis again. Uh, they, they are adequate only as much as they are used on a day-to-day -day basis. You can't wait until uh, a situation occur and then try to implement uh, um, integrated process or NIMS or ICS or whatever. These things have to be um, blended into the fabric of training. Public health has to be aware of what the terminology is. Uh, in New York, they've done quite a good job of credentialing private sector so that private sector know what language to use to get through the security line so that they can get into their critical um, inventories and resources that they have going on. Uh, it comes back to uh, bringing folks around, to, around the table and not just putting them in the EOC when you have something happen, but making sure that they're on uh, the planning side, the, the training side, the response side, the recovery side, and making sure that they feel a part of that process. And that training is to train all levels um, uh, of what the incident command system structure process. Uh, and it gets down even to the identification of resources and making sure that you have um, a list. Uh, if it, a three-legged widget is a three-legged widget is a three-legged widget. My, my summary, the um, Houston area is noted for having uh, a uh, high technology approach to this issue of coordination and command and control. Could you tell us a little bit about that? About 10 years ago, a little bit over that now, uh, we started a concept called TransStar. It actually started out as a consortium of uh, four partners in the Houston area, City of Houston, Harris County, our Metropolitan Transit Authority, and the Port of Houston where we uh, got together to discuss uh, transportation mobility because a lot of the evacuation situations, a lot of the challenges that we face as emergency responders uh, deal with just mobility and, uh, and, and getting people where they need to be. And so like many other metropo major metropolitan areas, we have series of cameras and, uh, and uh, communications links, including a regional radio network, uh, our hurricane evacuation camera setups, and then some uh, real-time sensors that will tell us what traffic speeds are, congestion, things like that. Uh, what we've really learned, though, is that uh, an over-reliance on technology can sometimes be a hindrance if people aren't trained in its use and, and use it day-to-day -day routinely. So the key is we add these new elements, such as uh, web-based uh, interactive tools, and, um, and uh, more robust interoperable communication systems, we find out that the key once again comes back to those basic relationships, an understanding of how the systems work together, and then most importantly is a willingness and an understanding that uh, whatever functions we may have in our day-to-day -day operations may not be necessarily the same ones we fill during an emergency. And uh, one of the first things that uh, uh, that we learned in command and control school is that uh, we, we need to check our egos at the door and realize that, that we're here for a common good. And uh, that is that is really uh, really helped us enhance our technological capabilities and, and make the best use of them. Andrew, has that perspective uh, um, been adopted in Chicago as well and in, and in Illinois more generally? 
Well, in, in Chicago, and I, I can speak to that because I, you know, exercise purview over emergency management there. But a big reliance on technology, but taking taking disparate systems and integrating them into, you know, one system where you can have some, you know, actionable intelligence that can be used to assist, you know, with emergency situations. And Chicago is unique in that in its emergency management office, it also has you know, traffic management, 911 operations, and so it brings together a number of disciplines under one roof. And so, much like what uh, Mike Montgomery mentioned about the camera surveillance, Chicago has a very robust and, uh, camera surveillance platform where they've placed thousands of cameras throughout the city, as well as cameras on the different interstates, so that way they can be used not only to monitor traffic, as well as having that built in analytic software. Uh, as Mike mentioned, but also to monitor potential, you know, evacuation situations that may occur. And so, at the state level, we're trying to leverage those technologies to integrate those systems with the state of Illinois, so that way we can be a partner. And this is that collaboration piece. You know, the state working closely with large metropolitan areas to share technology, to share. Uh, information so that way, in the event that there is a catastrophic incident, you know we can all be on the same page in terms of the information flow, and we could also at least know what we need to do to effectively execute you know our plan to address whatever situation may be at hand. So from the perspective of the command and control, one of the things that I've noticed is that you've had an increase of many, many entities to include the private sector that are taking many of the NIMS courses and the NGOs are all taking you know the NIMS courses and becoming you know certified in ICS and in a number of the other different command and control type courses and so there seems to be you know uh, obviously a strong you know um, uh, interest if you will in all of these different entities you know becoming trained in NIMS so that way everybody does understand that language which is going to be key there in a major situation or major disaster. Andrew has just been referring to the uh, National Incident Management System, or NIMS, um, which has grown out of the uh, Incident Command System. It started about 35 years ago in California in the uh, wildland firefighting business. Uh, Congress in 2002 required that all uh, emergency management agencies and jurisdictions adopt this NIMS framework as a way of uh, running an event. And I'm curious uh, whether, uh, from the point of view of the three of you, um, whether the NIMS system seems to be taking hold, uh, whether it's making progress, and uh, where there are shortcomings in that progress, uh, what sorts of shortcomings are you seeing? Uh, Ellis, uh, being from California, even after the um, wildland fire ICS program, there was the SIMS program, Standardized Emergency Management System. That resulted as a result of the um, uh, Oakland Hills fires in 1980-81, uh, when a congressman, house, a state legislative house burned down, uh, primarily because a folks showed up, uh, their um, fire trucks were incompatible, their communications was incompatible, their language was incompatible, etc. And they wanted to make sure that that never happened again, that is, resources were coming to, the, uh, to assist, that their equipment was compatible and their uh, terminologies, etc. So that is, is what happened out of that. NIMS is a product of the same thing after many disasters, and you want to make sure that people get on board. There's been an effort, I know in California, and I know in many other states, that this training has been required to even continue to get the funds, and it's not just your first responder training, there's also executive level training so that the um, uh, executives understand the terminology and the language in which you're dealing with. So. To that degree, that piece has been effective. The um, uh, other other terminology uh, working within the emergency operations centers have been standardized. So it's, it's in my opinion, uh, it's been something that's uh, added value to the response in the country. As Ellis has explained, there was probably no other state than uh, California that had a bigger running start on getting. Uh, uh, along with the uh, the NIMS uh, perspective, 
Um, perhaps uh, Andrew and Mike could comment on how this has been adopted and, and uh, whether it's been welcomed or not in uh, uh, Illinois and uh, Texas. Our, Andrew Velasquez, um, you know, we, we in essence have become a NIMS state, um, not only from the perspective of, you know, public safety, but also taking it to you know, the next level and ensuring that our public works folks um, are trained in NIMS. All of the individuals that would be brought together during a catastrophic incident, all of those folks that would come together, the Illinois Commerce Commission, state police, the Illinois National Guard, all of the relevant agencies, you know, from the perspective of public safety, public works, the private sector, everyone coming together, all of those folks have had, obviously, training in, in NIMS because we are a NIMS state, but it's been incredible the, the interest that has uh, we have seen uh, among many of the NGOs as well as the private sector wanting to become, you know, certified in NIMS, and so uh, we are a NIMS state. Uh, it has been embraced in the state of Illinois, and from the perspective of the city of Chicago, uh, when I was there as the executive director, we ensured that all of our emergency responders were trained in NIMS, as well as all of the security directors. Uh, that were part of you know, many of the private sector um, you know, agencies in the central business district, all of the entities uh, that were part of the financial districts, just making sure, as Ellis uh, alluded to earlier, the importance of ensuring that everybody understands that same terminology, that same language. So there's no chaos or confusion during a catastrophic incident or an event that may occur. Let me jump on here, and again, I have to echo what, what both of my uh, uh, partners have said here. Uh, across the state of Texas, NIMS has taken hold. Uh, it, it's, we have a little bit different situation just because of the sheer size of the state and the tremendous uh, diversity of, of the, the population densities. Uh, what has evolved here in the state as a, res as a direct result of the NIMS initiatives has been a, a, a group of uh, regional coordination groups where we've actually uh, split the state into eight regions based on local councils of government and disaster districts so that uh, we can respond more appropriately and quickly. But without question, this, this concept of, uh, of a nationwide system of resource typing and using common terminology has, has really helped Texas become a NIMS uh, a NIMS state from, from one end to the other. And the other key focus that we're starting to see really evolve and take hold is this concept of all hazards uh, incident command and control systems. As people begin to realize it's not just uh, about first responders, it's expanding definition of what is a first responder into public works, public health, the hospital systems, uh, just this whole concept of continuity of, of government and continuity of operations has really broadened the scope of, of who we train and, and, and who is a participant and a stakeholder. And, and once now that we've embraced this concept of all hazards, uh, we see this regardless of whether it's a hurricane or the, uh, the wildfire situation that we're going through right now, ice storms or, or whatever, the concept seems to have taken hold. The concept of, uh, of an all-hazards approach is a very powerful one because many of the things that emergency planners or emergency responders would want to be able to do would be very similar no matter what the scenario. But we've started in our discussion to make some distinctions as well, and without abandoning that uh, all-hazards approach, um, we've, we've already spoken about the difference between notice and no-notice events. We've had a couple of questions from our audience that I want to follow up on. Uh, that really ask about uh, specific types of situations. Um, in one of them, um, one of our uh, questioners has, has asked, what happens when there is a hazard that doesn't affect everyone in, in the area, uh, but, a very, but people in a very particular uh, path of, uh, of danger? Uh, for example, if there were a toxic release with a plume that was blowing in a, in a specific direction. Have your cities thought about those kinds of circumstances where you had to do a partial evacuation, uh, perhaps one that you could predict, as might be the case uh, for a storm, or perhaps one that you wouldn't be able to predict, um, as in the case of, uh, of a toxic release that uh, you had no warning about? 
FDR and Mike Montgomery here. I'll jump right on that one. Uh, we're home to a very large petrochemical complex, and so we're very sensitive to, uh, to potential chemical releases. And working hand in glove with our private partners, we have developed a system uh, which is very simple for the public to understand. It uses the concept of notifications, watches, and warnings, depending on the severity and the nature of, uh, of the event, but also depending on the type of, uh, of the effect on the population. For example, if a, if a population is going to have an immediate or, or a, a, a potentially dangerous impact, they will get a warning notice. And as we get farther and farther out from that, uh, from that, uh, from the event itself, we go to a watch, and then go to a uh, to a notification only. And we're doing a very good job with public outreach of of. Uh, training our public and, and uh, educating them on what that system means. Likewise, we've got a very uh, very good system of uh, reverse callbacks whereby we can notify people by as many as six different identifications per, uh, per system that, or per person that's opted into the system. So these are the two, uh, the two key components of our system here, and they work extremely well whether these are related uh, I mean, weather-related events or whether they are uh, technological-type events. Ellis or Andrew, would you care to comment? I think Mike did an excellent job, and uh, from time to time you have those uh, incidents on, on freeways, too, where you have trucks overturned, et cetera, and uh, the process of getting information out either through public address systems on the vehicles or through uh, what I call the CNN effect. Uh, pretty, pretty much people are tuned into something. And with the um, systems out there, you're able to get information out. So uh, one part of that, however, is uh, a great deal of it is education of the public. Because now, if for those no-notice events that may be on a freeway, the concept of in-place sheltering is, is critical. And it's important that people understand because in many cases, depending on the uh, weather, uh, things could be moving fast enough that if, it's, uh, if you stay in place in a protected area, you're in, you're in better shape than uh, actually trying to evacuate. Another record. Uh, I'm sorry. Another uh, one of our listeners asked about a different scenario. That is the planning for evacuation that might be required around a nuclear power plant. Uh, are there uh, differences, either legal differences or other kinds of differences that affect your planning for that? Aaron, Andrew, Andrew Velasquez. Um, you know, Illinois benefits greatly from the processes that give off, you know, ionizing radiation, and so Illinois is home to the most nuclear reactors out of any other state in the country. So, you know, we have a plan called the Illinois Plan for Radiological, you know, Accidents, and we're required to exercise that that plan for every nuclear plant, you know, every every two years, and it's a a, a graded plan where you have the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA involved uh, in, you know, that particular exercise and drill and involved in that scorecard process, if you will. And so uh, what's important here is working very closely with the utility companies, uh, making sure that you have that strong partnership with not only the utilities but the, the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and also ensuring that all of the individuals that live within the communities where these nuclear power plants reside, making sure that they are you know, well versed in your planning efforts, making sure that they know what the potential is that can occur in the event that there is some sort of a release, uh, you know, providing them information about sheltering in place versus evacuation, letting them know what those warning systems are that are in place, what those warning signals mean, uh, also, just informing them of, of what steps are are being taken to ensure that you know we are safeguarding these communities against potential you know accidents that may result from a, a nuclear power plant. So that's a very very important aspect of our planning operations in Illinois. One of our listeners has just followed up on this question uh, by saying, in the event of uh, an emergency, 
um, that would create a great deal of fear, perhaps a, a nuclear event, but also perhaps just a dirty bomb, which would not be anywhere near as severe in reality. Um, how would you handle those who would self-evacuate out of a feeling of fear rather than because they were being asked to do it uh, and it was necessary? This is a, a problem that's often called shadow evacuation. Uh, this is Ellis uh, Stanley, having um, actually done the first six nuclear facility exercise following Three Mile Island. Um, there was a lot of fear around the practice in exercising of uh, the Brunswick nuclear facility back in um, 1980, 81. Um, and again, it, it goes down to education. The uh, public, relative to the six new facilities, as, as Andrew indicated, those are in the no notice category because you, you've got a 10 mile planning zone, then you've got a 50 mile, um, uh, you got a 10 mile ingestion zone, and then a 50 mile planning zone that people uh, have the opportunity to participate in, et cetera. With a quote, dirty bomb, the information is, is not as, uh, there's, there's a lack of information or a lack of education as to what the ramifications and impacts are. And when you can't get that information out to people, that's when your, your fear may set in. And uh, a lot of it is a matter of um, understanding how your plume dispersions work and understanding how you can relate that in some kind of fashion, usually over the television to the public to uh, keep those fears down. Uh, the, the, the lower the bomb, or a dirty bomb, the, uh, the dirtier it is, the higher it is, maybe the um, impact area would be uh, increased. So it, it really is, uh, in a city that's 500 square miles, you, you're not ever going to have anything like that that's going to take an entire city out. But you do have to be able to very quickly assess what the uh, impact of the damage is, assess where the, um, quote, hot areas are, and be able to convey that to the public so you can reduce the fears. And uh, hopefully make sure the hospitals and other congregate care facilities are addressed in that arena so that people don't have to worry about uh, their relatives or friends being uh, trapped in those particular areas. Mike, I would, uh, in, uh, in the Houston-Galveston area, uh, Hurricane Rita occurred only about two weeks after Hurricane Katrina. So your citizens had seen people who had fled from Hurricane Katrina in the New Orleans area and other parts of the Gulf. They had seen all the television pictures of people losing their belongings in their homes. Um, I imagine that you had, when you announced uh, evacuation from Rita, that this, uh, must have been a tremendous amount of this shadow evacuation. Without question, uh, we, we refer to it as the Katrina effect, and there's no question that uh, seeing people uh, being plucked off their rooftops and uh, the pictures of the heroic rescues that uh, the Coast Guard had done and others had done throughout the, uh, the weeks prior uh, clearly influenced and uh, created spontaneous and shadow evacuations. Uh, we also had some conflicting messages from some of the uh, from some of our officials that uh, that we think had an influence, but probably the most single influencing factor was the news media. Uh, a poll that we did of people that evacuated uh, that we did after they the, they came home was that 80 percent, 80 percent over three of the four folks that evacuated uh, got their message to evacuate from the local news media. And one of the challenges that we faced was uh, was being sure that the same message was being communicated to and communicated by the local news media. So one of the key things that we focus on as part of our public outreach programs now is uh, when an event like this comes up, we now have gone to a, uh, a regional approach to our public information operations and established the concept of a JIC or a Joint Information Center. Uh, to make sure that the, the messages that are going out are well coordinated and that they take into account the uh, concerns and needs of all of our region's uh, citizens.
you mentioned that your focus on the media seems uh, extremely important here. Um, Andrew and Ellis, would you like to comment a little bit more about uh, the role that the media plays and how uh, you have thought about um, making sure that it reinforces and complements what you're doing rather than is antagonistic to it? All right, this is Ellis. Uh, it, it's a critical component. Uh, it is, however, a two-edged sword. Uh, the two-edged sword is without providing good, solid uh, information. Uh, they kind of wind up uh, just putting data out that's usually not confirmed, and it can lead to um, uh, policy on the fly, as it were. I, I will refer you to uh, Katrina. Two incidents occurred in Katrina in which the media took it and ran with it. Uh, one was uh, on the rescue, a boat going to the roof of a house to rescue an old lady. A dog swam by the boat. And for the next three days, that's all the media talked about was the dog. Uh, we, we love our pets in this country, but uh, clearly that was not, uh, should not have been the focus for three days is to talk about that dog. Subsequently, the first piece of legislation that came out of Congress post-Katrina was uh, the pet bill because it uh, relayed to having uh, pets evacuated with the same um, level of concern that you did people. The second incident that occurred was showing one looter a hundred times does not a hundred looters make. Uh, and to the point that the policy was changed in which the police chief came on TV and said he was pulling his people off of rescue to deal with looting. Now, eight feet of water and somebody's got a 36-inch TV, who cares? That's not where your resources should be. You should, your resources should stay on, on the uh, rescue effort. Having said that, had the media been at the table, been around the table in the planning process, and then you had your system in place, to get good information to the media, you wouldn't have had a better tool to convey uh, messages, et cetera. We had one incident where, um, uh, again, CNN uh, flew into uh, the dome, the, uh, the New Orleans uh, Superdome, and, and kept complaining about nothing was there. And I asked the question, why didn't you take anything in there if you flew in there with a helicopter and you had the capability? Uh, and they, they didn't because CNN, unlike other stations, aren't local media outlets. They've never claimed to be a local station. So you have to make sure that your local people, uh, and when we do training in Los Angeles, we made sure that the media was part of that training, not to cover it, but to be part of the, uh, the takeaways and be part of being able to use that most powerful resource that they possess to get information out, make sure that they are part of that uh, process. We have had uh, I'm sorry, someone else wants to answer. We have had at least uh, three questions uh, asked by listeners about the special needs uh, issue that Mike talked about uh, before, and I want to go back to that then. Um, one question uh, related to the question to uh, the issue of HIPAA concerns about cataloging who, was, who had special needs. A second issue uh, asked whether there were uh, special shelters uh, for special needs individuals. And finally, there was a question in general about who would staff the shelters. So perhaps I could bring those first three, those three questions first to Mike Montgomery. Sure, I appreciate, I appreciate the, uh, the, the listeners' questions. Uh, without question, the HIPAA, the HIPAA concern is, is one of the key things. The state of Texas system is actually an opt-in system. Uh, we don't record any data until someone calls in and actually requests that data. Uh, this is going to be a challenge regardless of which system you put in place or try to do it. As a result of that, we know that the, the number of people that have been identified in our system is underreported. Uh, and to give you an example, when we went into last year's hurricane season, uh, despite the public outreach, despite the, the billboards, the public service announcements, and so forth, and despite the state of Texas uh, very strong support in getting, uh, getting the, the word out on this program, uh, in this area we had uh, less than 2,000 people that had signed up. Now, re remember during RETA we had evacuated over 200,000 with special needs. Uh, and, and that's those that needed just arrived. But in medical special needs, 
we expected we could have as many as 45,000 people that would need uh, assistance. So we were very concerned by this. What was interesting, though, when we had Hurricane Zine and later Hurricane Umberto that came in, the number of people that uh, that uh, called in to opt into the system went up tremendously. So what we found out is, is despite all of our best efforts to, to educate and communicate with the public, sometimes it takes the uh, the specter of a of a of an event coming down the road, and I think that's going to just ha that's going to get better with education. With regard to the second question, um, in terms of medical special needs, yes, the shelters do need to be appropriate. Uh, there are three problems that you are three categories of, of evacuation community. There are the evacuating communities, that is, those that are leaving, the pass-through communities, the ones that we're traveling through to get to our final destination, and then the, uh, the receiving communities. And uh, very similar to what Andrew was saying, we have, we have identified and developed uh, hub-and-spoke arrangements. The challenge is in the level four and level five special needs patients and uh, getting them identified with a specific shelter. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this slide better than I can see it, but level four and level five, those are actually point-to-point -point evacuations where we're getting into an acute uh, care facility or a long, uh, hospital or long-term care facility. The biggest concern that we face right now that, uh, that we're really focusing on are what we call the level three uh, medical special needs folks because they, they actually do need something more than just a general population shelter because of the level of care that they need to get. And as you can see from this slide right here, uh, these are the folks that, that, that require ongoing medical care, monitoring, medications, and their equipment. Uh, we may have some mental health disorders. And what we found during the uh, Katrina mega shelter operations and, and, and uh, similar other area shelter operations, uh, a general population shelter really just did not have the staffing nor the facilities to, uh, to adequately care for these folks. And that leads to the third question is who should staff these shelters? When we start talking about medical special needs, it's very important that the sheltering operation, both in size and also in capability, needs to be matched to the people that will be evacuating into it. And so there is a distinction between a general population shelter and then a shelter that is specifically identified and designated and equipped and staffed for, uh, for medical special needs. We rely very heavily on the Volunteer Medical Corps. We rely very heavily on our medical centers. And uh, during the Katrina operations, we got tremendous support from across the state and the nation, uh, doctors, physicians, uh, nurses, other health care attendants, that just wanted to help. Uh, again, this is going to depend on the, the type of evacuees that uh, you expect to see, their numbers, and then what type of resources that you've got available within your region. Very good questions. Andrew or Ellis, would, uh, would you like to add anything to that? Well, I, I thought Mike did an excellent job. I think there's some opportunity for some legislation uh, to occur on this because uh, to be able to, to have to wait till there's a need to be able to uh, have folks opt in really creates a strain on the response mechanism because it appears at all times that you've not done your due diligence when you cannot say today I mean what your requirement is for special needs. Um, and I, I think HIPAA sometimes is um, misused because uh, what we as uh, planners and first responders need is not to know what the, uh, the, the the illness is. We just need to know that we have a patient or an individual that needs assistance. And HIPAA actually refers to giving out medical information on the individual. And uh, emergency management needs to be included up front uh, in the process of being able to get this information. There's another element, too, when we look at people with special needs when we're having to do with evacuation that's not always medical. Uh, it could be just that you don't have transportation that makes you uh, uh, need it. It could be that you um, uh, came from the doctor this week and you, you are bedridden and you are typically would not be special needs, but for this particular instance you are because your leg may be in a cast or, or something like that. So it has to be fluid and dynamic. 
but I think to ease some of the burden, the legislation needs to be changed so that emergency planners can have this information. Um, and and if, it, if, if there's a privacy issue, the opt-in could be, unless we hear from you, to take your name off the list, you already you are in the list. As opposed to, we have to hear from you to put your name on the list. It's better planning if you say, if you don't want to be on this list, you call us and we'll take you off. And that would put the onus on the individual to um, deal with any concern they may have on privacy. Andrew, Chicago has had its own reasons for being very sensitive to the issue of uh, people who might slip through the cracks. Um, I'm speaking, of course, of the uh, experience that you had with the heat wave during the 1990s uh, that left a number of people dead and that led Chicago to begin thinking very hard about this question of how to deal with special needs uh, individuals in, in times of uh, severe stress. Are there things that you'd like to add to this uh, from Chicago's experience or more generally from Illinois? Well, certainly. Um you know, I, you mentioned the, the heat wave situation that occurred in the early 90s, and just shortly thereafter, the mayor commissioned, you know, a committee uh, to look at ways to ensure that we had the appropriate measures in place to address, you know, special needs populations, uh, and to, of course, include the elderly. And so, Chicago has taken a, a leadership role in many ways, and. Uh, implementing the programs that would ensure that the special needs populations are protected against, obviously, the hazards that are germane to the city, as well as circumstances that involve extreme heat and extreme cold situations. And so they've uh, put together cadres of individuals that would work toward ensuring that individuals are checked out during times of uh, extreme cold or extreme heat circumstances, putting together an emergency 311 system. Uh, to ensure that the people can uh, call for well-being checks, uh, empowering the neighbors to come in and check on their neighbors to ensure that you know their neighbors are you know are, are okay, uh, and to ensure that if they need assistance, they can call the appropriate agencies to provide assistance. Now, taking that uh, obviously from the perspective of evacuations, uh, the special needs population piece is critical you know, to our evacuation you know, components that are part of our evacuation plans. That includes evacuation, you know, outside of the city of Chicago, as well as um, the receipt of evacuees that will come into shelters. Uh, we also look at it from the perspective of the types of shelters that would be open. We'd have short-term shelters and then as well as long-term shelters. And it's in those circumstances where you have those situations where you may need to stand up a shelter for, you know, somewhat of a lengthy period of time that you have to ensure that you have the appropriate personnel staffed in there to address the individuals that have special needs, but also to ensure that you have locations, much like Mike mentioned, that are specific to individuals with special needs. And so, just like Mike mentioned, we look at the at the approach of ensuring that we have the shelters that are, that are for, if you will, those general populations, and then also having shelters that are stood up for individuals that have special needs. Thanks very much. Um, a little earlier in our discussion about special needs, uh, we were focusing on the issue of staffing, and it seemed to me that uh, it was appropriate to think of that in a more general context as well, um, particularly in situations that may extend over more than a short period of time that might stretch out to be days or perhaps even weeks. Um, the question of, of staff resources by government agencies, by uh, voluntary organizations that are participating uh, by a variety of other partners becomes a serious question. And I wondered how uh, your jurisdictions are addressing this issue of doing the um, manpower planning for uh, emergency response and a major evacuation. Mike, did you experience that in uh, the uh, Hurricane Rita situation? We experienced it both in, in Rita and in Katrina. What was interesting is, um, well, let me just say it this way in, in summary. We've got a very robust Citizens Corps program, and one of the keys to the success of the mega shelter operations in Katrina was the ability to reach out, request assistance from, and receive that assistance over a three-week period of over 60,000 volunteers that came in to staff that shelter. 
uh, without their efforts and without their ability to respond, uh, the, the outcome may have been much different. One key point to remember there is because we were a receiving community that had not been impacted by the storm itself, we had no interruptions of infrastructure. We uh, were able to, most of our citizenry was able to get on with their daily lives. And so this was actually an event within the event. Um, it was a completely different situation during Rita where the, the emphasis was more on evacuating rather than on, on receiving. And so the number, of, the number of people we had to staff particular operations was relatively small and was well within the, uh, the normal day-to-day -day activities of county, government, county and city government. The big challenge, though, was to the outlying more rural and suburban areas that, uh, in essence, became pass-through communities. And uh, this greatly taxed the volunteer fire departments, the volunteer EMS agencies, and some of our smaller communities that uh, only had one or two main roads and uh, one or two stoplights, and we were clogging them up pretty badly. Um, another thing to note is that once a, a uh, presidential disaster declaration was in place, uh, this opened up the potential for reimbursement and it simplified the staffing question somewhat. Uh, there is a challenge though, if, if you are a receiving community, uh, you're going to have to really have an understanding of what the effect is and justify how that is, is outside of normal uh, governmental requirements and, and, and what government should be providing to uh, be thinking about reimbursement. All right, this is uh, Ellis. Just last week, uh, the governor of California saw this as such a significant event that he um, actually took his volunteer, his uh, volunteer person in the state and moved it up to a cabinet level. As a result of the um, oil spill in the Bay Area a few months back, had hundreds and hundreds of volunteers showing up, and they didn't have a way of use, utilizing them or incorporating them. That he saw it was a wasted um, uh, resource, so he moved his uh, volunteer agency up to a cabinet level position. Um, again, uh, that it's very. There's nothing worse than having untrained volunteers show up. It, it really creates a um, negative impact on the, on the response. But if you can beforehand, as both speakers have already talked about, identify these resources, whether they're CERT volunteers, whether they're medical volunteers, whether they're others, um, get them in, train them, credential them, you do have a force multiplier for your response. And uh, I, I think the governor will uh, probably set an example for other states to, to look at doing the same thing. Um, in a disaster of the sort that we're talking about, public safety workers, um, emergency medical uh, professionals, and a variety of other responders are obviously going to be highly motivated uh, to use their skills to help the public. But they also are uh, people with families. And I wonder whether your jurisdiction could address the question of how to deal with the families of responders, that those responders go about their duties uh, without having to uh, be as worried about their families as they might otherwise be and feel torn in two directions. Uh, Ellis, again, the best first responder is the one that have taken care of their own uh, individual resources themselves, i.e., taking care of their families, making sure that they have uh, uh, left them in good stead, making sure that they understand where they would be and uh, how they would get access and uh, get out of an area. Uh, you are you are useless in a response arena if 99% of your time is being focused on uh, your family. So uh, what we look at in the city of Los Angeles was making sure that every the 50,000 city employees were were the first uh, trained and that they had their own individual and family plans in place. Andrew, did your area think about that as well? Uh, absolutely, Aaron. and I think you know the other factor here too is, you know, when you when you develop your plans, um, you know, your all hazards planning because that's that's the focus that we have both in Chicago, and in Illinois. It's it's also appropriate that, you know, each each relevant public safety agency also you know has a staffing plan in place, and it, it may be a matter of of saying that you know you. You, you have a, a component of your, of your staff 
that that leads to go and ensure that they have you know family members that are being addressed and taken care of, and working on a rotation to ensure that once they're aware that their family members are taken care of, that they come back, but also ensuring that there are incentives in place to make sure that they do come back to assist with the emergency. So much like what Ella said, I think the key is also ensuring that your family members, you know, are prepared themselves. You know, we, we oftentimes stress the importance as emergency managers and public safety officials about ensuring that other people are prepared for emergencies, but we also have to make sure that our own families, you know, follow that same advice that we're given to others. And so much like what Ellis mentioned, it's key and critical that we have plans in place to be self-sustaining, that we have plans in place to ensure that we can communicate and meet somewhere. But, what, you know, it's, but it's, what it's also important is public safety agencies must have their own plans in place to address, you know, the staffing issues, the rotation issues, different things of that nature. There was a recent study done, this is Mike Montgomery, a recent study that said during a, uh, especially during a health disaster, we should expect as many as 30 percent of our personnel to be unavailable for work, either because of family concerns, fears, or other obligations. And so this, this concept of defining essential personnel and establishing rotational schedules is critical along with a, a way that, that employees can call in, can be notified uh, of, of what conditions are and what the expectations are, but cannot overemphasize this, this, uh, this need to be sure that we take care of our employees' families first and their needs. Uh, uh, that, that's critical. Uh, if, if, they, if they feel that their family needs have not been met, at, at best they're going to be distracted in their work. At worst, uh, they may not return to work. So by identifying what their needs are and, and helping them meet those needs first, it really does change the, the focus and the nature of the response. To some extent, this conversation is focusing on the question of what happens when plans that are in place for dealing with an evacuation or other aspects of a disaster uh, go awry and they turn out not to work uh, as well as we wanted or whether circumstances uh, turn out to be different than the ones that we planned for. And I wonder whether we could talk a little bit more about this issue. Uh, one of our listeners asked this question in particular relating to the question of communication systems. Um, it's often a feature of major disasters that communication systems go down and that what responders had expected to be available uh, is not. Uh, I wonder whether you could speak a little bit about how your jurisdictions are thinking about this question of communications failure and how you would deal with that in a backup mode. I can start addressing that, Arne. You know, it, it's, when we talk about the importance of, you know, communications, you know, over the course of the last uh, couple of years and, and just after 9-11, you know, uh, there were talks about, you know, failures in communication systems and lack of interoperability. But we have to remember that interoperability is not just from a radio perspective. Interoperability involves, you know, uh, GIS. It involves satellite communications. It involves a number of factors. And so we have to ensure that we have the appropriate redundancies in place in the event that one communications platform becomes inoperable, we can immediately transition to another form of communications. And so uh, as a case in point in Illinois, you know, we have... Uh, worked very uh, diligently to ensure that we have multiple redundancies in place, not just from the perspective of radio communications, but any other sort of communications where, you know, we, we, we communicate uh, that's having, you know, backup redundancies for radios, that's ensuring that we work with the cellular phone companies to ensure that they have, you know, robust critical, you know, robust infrastructures in place and backup systems for their respective infrastructures. And so the communications piece is critical, it's key, and it's it's important. And we look at, you know, communications from the standpoint of reverse 911 systems, being able to send blast messages out to people, you know, from 911 centers alerting them of emergencies, uh, making sure that you have redundant communication platforms in place from a radio perspective. Local jurisdictions have their own radio systems, but from the state perspective, making sure that we can deploy, you know, mobile communication systems in the field in the event that your communications infrastructure goes down, we can set up communications pods in the field to facilitate interoperable communications among multiple jurisdictions. So it's ensuring that you have all of these systems in place that could you know, serve to augment as well as serve as backup communications capabilities during crises and disasters. 
Are there comments on that issue? Well, let me move on to something else. We, our focus in this uh, discussion is, uh, uh, by design, was on issues of evacuation in major cities. Um, but several of our uh, listeners have written in and asked about the problems, the distinctive problems that face smaller communities. Um, and I wondered whether um, you could speak about this. Um, one and each of you, in, in one way or another, has experience with these uh, smaller communities as well as with large communities. Um, one listener asked, what advice could you offer for, for small regions that have very limited resources and staff for thinking about uh, the evacuation issues that are our focus today? This is Ellis. Um, uh, when you talk about uh, Los Angeles metropolitan area, uh, you are talking about 88 cities within the county of Los Angeles. You're talking about uh, over 20 million people in the regional area. And the advice I would offer is that they need to get around the table as well. I know the larger cities will allow them around the table. It's, it's a matter of reaching both ways to sit down and look at uh, the critical infrastructure components because in some cases you have cities within cities. So it's important that they uh, are, are at the table. In many cases, you already have a automatic fire uh, response methodology uh, in place with these uh, smaller jurisdictions because they just don't have the wherewithal to have all the equipment that's necessary in their uh, jurisdiction. So become part of the planning process. Look at the regional uh, exercising uh, involvement. Involvement. When we started off talking about um, evacuation of large areas, we indicated that it was regional in nature because you have to cross boundaries. Uh, typically, there is not a regional elected official, so it's just uh, apparent, uh, apparent that you have to sit down uh, with the planners, the first responders, and make sure that everyone understands what the potentials are in these smaller cities and how they may be impacted. And I think Mike even talked about uh, whether it, you're just passing through those cities. Uh, we have cities out around our air, airport that it's necessary that they're around the table when we're talking about uh, emergency regulations. This is Mike. One of the things that we learned during the read evacuation from our smaller communities uh, farther inland was that they felt that they did not, uh, they had not been adequately informed about what was getting ready to happen in these smaller pass-through communities, and we have encouraged them since that point uh, to get involved in the process. To, again, to echo Alice, there, uh, these, when we have a, a, cat a catastrophe like this, this is going to be a regional event, and the effect on smaller communities uh, may be more profound than it is on the major metropolitan area itself simply because of the, the scarcity of resources. Um, again, I guess the, the recommendation to, to the questioner would be, uh, if at all possible, just to get involved in the process and let your concerns be known and uh, whatever resources you do have available or lack thereof, communicate those so that the, uh, the resulted plan can, uh, can take those things better into account. Arne, this is Andrew. What has worked well in Illinois is the establishment of strong mutual aid partnerships. Uh, mutual aid partnerships among, you know, contiguous counties uh, within the regions that we have established throughout the state. We've broken the state down into eight regions, and so all of the emergency managers within those regions have established their own regional consort consortiums, if you will. And so they share resources. Um, they can immediately de deploy, you know, assets during times of crisis to assist those counties that are contiguous to their, you know, individual counties. And so, establishing strong mutual aid partnerships is key, so that way you can address those particular, you know, hazards that may be germane to smaller communities. Another small communities uh, issue that was raised was uh, about how to communicate with the public, uh, especially where there is no media outlet that covers the particular jurisdiction in question, but rather covers either covers a larger area or where uh, there simply is no local media at all.
I, I've lived all over the country and worked in all size jurisdictions. There is some media there. It may not be the CNN you want or the uh, ABC, NBC, but there's um, radio uh, that you have the capability of. In, in some areas, the uh, NOAA weather radio is a, another excellent tool that you have the ability to uh, uh, talk to the people, as it were. Uh, many of the school systems have uh, systems that they uh, alert their teachers and, and being able to call families when the schools are out. So there are tools in the community, and especially in, in this day and time, the new media that's out here, uh, whether you're using PDA, cell phones, um, uh, Web 2.0, whatever, those, those are all mechanisms that can and should be used a lot more than they are. In the, in the rural, rural areas, many states have gone to um, Wi-Fi in their states so that there's internet within those particular areas. But I guarantee you they have some type of local radio, AM or FM, and those are outlets that you can get information as well. If they have telephone books, there's ways you can print information and get it in the telephone book. If you have um, uh, other type, uh, some areas actually have outdoor warning that have the capability to speak through those uh, sirens. So there are methods in this day and time that emergency managers, and, and as Andrew said, working through the state, and this is where you have to collaborate with the mutual aid and also the assets and resources of the state. I, I can't imagine in this day and time there's areas that wouldn't have access to some form of media. Another listener uh, issue that was raised was the uh, question of the appropriate role for uh, elected officials. Uh, our listener raised it particularly in the context of training for NIMS, but let me frame it in a larger question and really ask the question of what is the role for elected officials relative to that of the professional emergency managers who are involved in, in running uh, an emergency? Where does the elected official have distinctive responsibilities and authority and legitimacy? Where does the professional emergency manager have it? And how do you make sure that those folks are staying uh, in the right uh, in the right lanes for their expertise and authority. Uh, Mr. Ellis, let me start with the answer on that. Uh, the role of an elected official is, is to be a good leader, to be able to understand the process that's uh, been put in place for that jurisdiction, knowing where their resources are. Uh, you should never see an elected official speaking about public health matters but you should see an elected official introducing the public health director in the area to talk about the public health issues. You, uh, elected officials should do what they are best at, and that is hopefully communicating with their constituency in a way that is going to calm them down. It should be pulling together all the disparate agencies, disparate agencies within their jurisdiction and coming out with one voice being able to dispel the rumors that are uh, percolating in the community and be able to speak with the power to influence behavior of that jurisdiction. That's what a good elected official should be doing, and they do that by the training that they would get and understanding what the plan is, understanding the flexibility in, in the plan, and knowing where the lines of demarcation are, what they have responsibility and uh, legislation over and what the governor or uh, public health or even the federal have um, jurisdiction over. Thank you. Andrew, you work in a region that's known for uh, vigorous politics. Uh, is there a particular perspective there? Well, you know, I think what's important is um, always keeping your local officials in the loop, being very proactive on that front. I mean, you know, from the perspective of disasters in Illinois, whenever we have a disaster that's declared, you know, by the governor, uh, you know, always making sure that you keep those local officials in the loop, helping them to understand, much like Ellis mentioned, helping them to understand, let's say, for instance, the disaster declaration process, you know, going through the process with them. Um, making them aware of the fact that you're just not going to sign a blank check, that there are processes in place, you know, that, that require, you know, some work, damage assessments, different things along those lines. And so, 
you know, being proactive, helping them to understand the process, bringing them into briefings. Uh, we have what's called, you know, a legislators briefing where we bring them in to the EOC and go through, you know, our plans with them, explain the damage assessment process, how that whole thing works, telling them exactly what would happen during the disaster, how we would reach out to them, how we would keep them, you know, updated on those circumstances. Now, when you talk about situations involving, like, our mayor, uh, you know, from the Chicago's perspective, or our governor, they are the commander in chief during large-scale disasters, and it's my responsibility to ensure that they are well informed. Again, much like Ellis mentioned, to ensure that they know exactly what resources we have in place, what our strategy is, what our plan is, and so doing all of that proactively uh, will pay significant dividends in the end, if you will. Mike, in your jurisdiction, if I'm not mistaken, your county judge, who is the CEO of the county government, um, has a designated role in emergency management. Uh, has that made it easier uh, for uh, for the elected officials to be uh, uh, included into the decision making and management of a disaster in progress? I, I think it has made it easier. It also it can be a two-edged sword. We're very fortunate. Uh, we've got very good relationships between our county government and our city government. So the city elected officials and the county elected officials have worked very closely together to make sure that our plans truly are regional in scope and that uh, they communicate and collaborate very well together. And even though state statute does say that a county judge is the emergency director for the entire county, uh, what we've seen from a uh, what we've seen practically is that county judges and, and uh, mayors work extremely closely together to make sure that their uh, that their goals and objectives are consistent. Thank you. Um, another uh, one of our participants uh, raised a, a question that that uh, is quite directly related to the question of uh, evacuation, and that is the. Uh, the designation of evacuation zones uh, and timing plans for when people will leave, and also the designation of specific routes of egress that people should follow. Um, is it your opinion that these kinds of uh, arrangements put in place in advance are helpful, and is it possible that they could cause problems if a disaster doesn't necessarily go the way that uh, it was predicted to? Mike, uh, is that an issue that Houston has uh, dealt with? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that one here. Um, one of the key things that we found out were, were two things. Uh, we found out first that, that people in our area had difficulty understanding when they should actually evacuate. Uh, zone A, Zone B, Zone C, depending on, and this is from the hurricanes now, uh, it was difficult to understand what zone they lived in. So one of the things that we did as a result of the, uh, the lessons learned from Rita was to develop a, uh, a evacuation zones based on zip codes. And these work fairly well in, uh, or they can work fairly well in densely populated areas. They become less effective as you get into the rural areas. Uh, but what we did is we just came up with this idea of these uh, zip zone evacuation maps because we found out people, even uh, folks that were visiting from out of town, out of the region, and really weren't familiar with the evacuation zones per se, uh, could easily look at a uh, piece of hotel stationery and had a pretty good understanding of, of what zip zone or what zip code they were in. And that, that's one thing that we think is going to help us the next time. With regard to designated evacuation routes, we have designated specific evacuation routes, and these are the ones that are going to get the uh, that we can guarantee that services will be provided on these evacuation routes. So I think from that standpoint, yes, planned evacuation routes help. On the other hand, um, most people when they evacuate, especially those that are self-evacuating by private automobile, already have a destination in mind, and they may have another route in mind on how they're going to get there, especially if their evacuation plan does not take them from one of our uh, one of our hub and spoke arrangements to another evacuation hub. So rather than going, say, from the city of Houston to the city of Dallas, they want to go to Bryan College Station or uh, to their lake house or something. And so there has to be some flexibility built in that even though we do have designated evacuation routes, that does not preclude people from taking their own routes 
if they if they think they've got a better plan in mind that meets their needs. Ellis or Andrew, would you like to add anything to that? I would think that for us, um, you know, the issue of evacuation routes are, are more germane to those particular jurisdictions that have, you know, the the early warning that, um, you know, there's going to be a significant event on the way. We don't necessarily ascribe to the issue uh, of evacuation routes in the city of Chicago uh, simply because the majority of the hazards that we experience would be no notice hazards. And so I think this is something that's more particular to, you know, those areas that are, are threatened by extreme weather related type circumstances, your hurricanes, different things of that nature. Well, we have one last area of listener interest that uh, I want to follow up on, and it actually picks up on some of the comments that were made earlier about drills and exercises. Um, as a couple of our uh, uh, listeners have, have noted, uh, drilling on evacuation uh, is a very difficult uh, kind of thing to simulate. Um, and they were wondering whether there were examples that you could cite uh, of how that might be done, at what level and what kinds of drills are done, and whether there were any templates that you could suggest to people who are interested in uh, having their own area uh, do more in the way of practicing for these sorts of uh, 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 disasters. Uh, this is Ellis. Um, in, in Los Angeles, um, and I, I will invite all the listeners to tune in in November, November the 12th, 13th through the 15th, I believe, uh, they will be a international earthquake conference. And during that conference, there will be um, uh, an exercise that will hopefully get 20 million people involved. And a great deal of those will be through an evacuation process in which they will be relocating because the scenario will indicate a tsunami uh, coming in. So th even in large jurisdictions, you can get uh, people involved. Uh, the simple answer is to go to any major city at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and you'll see a good example of evacuating from a downtown area because people kind of figure out a way to get out of there pretty uh, uh, efficiently. Uh, but the, the, the true answer to that is uh, in some cases you have to use simulation. You have to use tools to and, and models. Uh, we have many of our freeways cemented. Uh, so we have the ability to uh, simulate that in pretty real time, uh, what the uh, evacuation uh, issues would be relative to uh, an incident that would occur. So um, we, we do those functional uh, exercises on a regular basis. And we've uh, got neighborhoods involved in which we actually evacuate some neighborhoods on a small scale where we only have uh, uh, three or 400 people involved in that process. So you have to do it incrementally, uh, and this will uh, go up to the November 12th, 14th, where we try to get uh, 20 million people involved in some fashion in an exercise. You know, we are, and this is Andrew Velasquez, we hosted uh, sometime last year, back in, in September, I think it was in 2006 in September during National Preparedness Month. You know, we uh, exercised a mass, you know, evacuation scenario uh, in the Central Business District. This is information that's available in the public domain. If somebody did a a Google search, if you will, on Chicago and conducting a mass evacuation drill, uh, we didn't have, you know, uh, the participants like like Ellis Stanley, uh, Ellis Stanley is mentioning in, in the 20, you know, million range, but we had about 5,000 people that participated and they actually evacuated a number of high-rise buildings in the central business district and then watched that evacuation process occur. We set up way stations along the way sort of simulating how those, that process would work, having individuals stop at those way stations, gathering information. And then a part of that process what we did was we um, uh, gave them, you know, go kits because we, we talked about the importance of you know, businesses having in their employees 
uh, purchase go kits and have those go kits, you know, at their desks in the event that they had to evacuate, you know, a, a, their buildings. And so we took a look at that. We we observed the the evacuation. Uh, we looked at some of the initial observations. We looked at some of the lessons learned, and then with with some of the information that we found, we were then able to take a look at our plans and make revisions where necessary. So. Mike, in your jurisdiction, you actually experienced a mass evacuation. Um, what did you take away from that situation uh, about the sorts of things that you needed to prepare for and drill uh, to be even better prepared for future situations? Well, come, uh, the, the things that really come to mind that we were able to address from a logistics standpoint were fuel along the evacuation routes and a better identification of, of what those actual evacuation routes were going to be than to bring that information to the public. But I think probably the, the, the number one lesson that we took away from all that was to develop better means of community outreach and public outreach and notification. And so a lot of our drills have focused on developing these regional information centers where we can get consistent and collaborating messages out with each other to better coordinate those those evacuation activities. Well, we've reached the uh, we've reached the scheduled time for the conclusion of um, our online uh, event, um, and I want to thank uh, uh, with great uh, um, sincerity our three uh, participants: uh, Mike Montgomery, the uh, fire marshal of Harris County, Texas. Uh, Andrew Velasquez, the uh, director of the Illinois State uh, Emergency Management Agency, and uh, Ellis Stanley, uh, now director of the Western Emer of Western Emergency Management Services of Dewberry and Davis, a former general manager of Emergency Preparedness Department of the City of Los Angeles. Uh, gentlemen, we're really grateful to you for giving us uh, so much insight from your experience. Um, and teaching us all a great deal about uh, the complexities of this topic. Um, I also want to thank um, the people here with me at Harvard Kennedy School who have uh, done such a good job of managing the technical process. Uh, Jim Cooney, who, without whom this event uh, surely would not have uh, occurred um, uh, right from the beginning of conceiving it and uh, managing it through to the end. Uh, and Maureen Griffin, um, who has uh, been manning a help desk, help desk and uh, uh, has been uh, crucial in, in uh, working this event. Uh, this is Arn Howitt uh, uh, speaking to you from Harvard Kennedy School at uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And we thank you, the listeners, very much for tuning in. Uh, we thank you for your participation in this event, and we hope that you found it a very valuable experience. Take care. Good night. Good night. Good night, all.